Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to welcome one of St. Paul's own, Dr. Kara McShane, um, to talk to us today about anti-Semitism and medieval literature. And Dr. McShane is um, a professor of literature at Ursinus College, sings in the choir, leads the anti-racism book group. So she's really, really busy. Um, <laughs> And so we're just so excited to have um, an hour of her time to learn from her in her field of specialty. So thanks for joining us today. Yes, thank you. It's a, um, it's a joy to be busy with wonderful and good things and, and to, to be involved. Um, and thanks y'all for finding some time on a gorgeous sunny Sunday. Uh, so I will share a couple of slides, um, but I'll leave the chat open. So if you have questions as we go, um, my plan is to talk for a half hour ish, but for us to have a lot of time to have conversations for you to ask questions, either about what I'm talking about today or how I um, I get a lot. How did a nice young lady like you wind up working on um, antisemitism? So I'm happy to field that too. All right, let's get the metaphorical party started. Is that the right share? Let me make sure. Fun. Great. All right, so, so anti-Semitism has been on the rise globally for the past several years, and this has been a particular problem in the US. Um, some of you all uh, will be familiar with some of these events. So you might remember, for example, shouts that Jews will not replace us at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville that was August, 2017. The program at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, that was October 27th, 2018. Bomb scares at a Jewish community center in Rochester, New York, um, which is where I did my uh, graduate research. So was certainly uh, memorable for me. Um, vandalism at a synagogue in New York City. So while antisemitism never vanishes, it has become increasingly pervasive in recent years. And if we look just at the numbers, the Anti-Defamation League has reported an all-time high of anti-Semitic actions in 2019, which is the last year that data is available for, with over 2,100 acts of assault, vandalism, and harassment. This was a 12% increase over the previous year, 2018. And it's worth noting that 2018, um, the ADL reported a 107% increase in such actions from the year before. So of course, not all of these actions are instigated by Christians, but many are. For example, earlier this year, we witnessed men wearing shirts reading Camp Auschwitz and six million wasn't enough, marching alongside others carrying Jesus flags as they breached the US Capitol in January. And it's perhaps obvious to decry and reject these kinds of actions, and a lot of Christian communities have, but the ideas that inspire them have other more insidious legacies ones that shape how many communities perceive Jews and Judaism, even in communities that speak out against this direct explicit violence. In particular, Christian support for Jewish communities is sometimes marked by these anti-Semitic legacies. David Scheifet, an associate professor of Jewish history at Northwestern University, um, really neatly articulated one major concern that many members of the Jewish community feel, especially about evangelical support. And this is a quote from him. They talk about support for Israel, their love for the Jewish people, and on the surface that comes across as very unifying. But there's a deep suspicion in much of the Jewish community that they see the state of Israel as a means to an end, that their support is based on the belief that when Jesus returns, the Jews will be converted to Christianity or wiped out. And this belief isn't a recent innovation. It has a lot of its origins in early Christian theology popularized during the Middle Ages. Um, and I want to be clear, so my field is primarily literature, uh, but I'm a giant nerd and I became a medievalist because I wanted to be able to do history and theology and philosophy and art in addition to literature. Um, and for a very long time now, I've been interested in how medieval English literature presents religious difference, especially in the Abrahamic tradition. So medieval England was predominantly Christian, surprise, um, but its literature shows strong interest in non-Christian belief systems and it tends uh, to present non-Christian people in a very bad light. So that interest led me to a lot of work on medieval English anti-Semitism, which is what I'm gonna focus on today. 
and I'm going to give a historical overview of sorts, then talk a bit about how these religious and legal issues were popularized in one particular thread of anti-Semitic narratives, the fall of Jerusalem narrative that I've been working on, um, especially in recent years, quite closely. And then I'll explore how those presentations and assumptions remain with us to now. So how did we get here? So to understand how anti-Semitism came to be popularized in literature, it's helpful to understand the um, context that these authors are working with and how those theological ideas shaped it. A lot of late medieval Christian thought about Judaism was shaped by Augustine and his theology about Jews, sometimes called the doctrine of toleration, which essentially it argued that Jews were kind of a proof of Christian truth. The existence of Jews proved the historicity of scriptural events. And inside of this, Augustine's reading of Psalm 59 was especially central to this doctrine of toleration. In its medieval English translation, um, Psalm 59 verse 11 reads, slay thou not them, lest any time my peoples forget, scatter thou them in thy virtue, and Lord, my defender, put thou them down. Christian theologians widely took Jews to be the antecedent for them here. And Augustine proved hugely influential, as in many other contexts, and it endangered Jewish communities throughout Europe. So Bernard of Clairvaux, who's one of the most active preachers in support of the Crusades, echoed Augustine as he wrote in the backdrop of the Second Crusade. In one Hebrew chronicle from what is now Germany, um, which recounts a, pro a pogrom or a mass slaughter of the Jewish community there, Rabbi Ephraim of Bonn writes, Bernard too spoke recuously, as is their manner, and this is what he said to them. It is good that you go against the Ishmaelites, that is Muslims, but whoever touches a Jew to take his life is like one who harms Jesus himself. My disciple Radel, who has spoken about annihilating the Jews, has spoken in error, for in the book of Psalms it is written of them, slay them not lest my people forget. This same sentiment based on Paul and Augustine also appears in Bernard's writings, where he insists that some remnant of the Jews must be spared for their eventual conversion at the end of time. And this marginalized status was exacerbated by proximity. Jews were scattered in communities throughout Europe, right? Whereas there weren't as many sort of communities of Muslims living in and among predominantly Christian regions. And this danger became particularly pronounced over time as it changed in medieval Christian hands. So Augustine's reading of Psalm 59 was further interpreted by later scholars and theologians and they came to understand Augustine not as condemning violence against Jews, but as forbidding forced conversion. So they concluded that slay them not wasn't an instruction to refrain from literal killing, but to making Jews stop being Jews. And because Jewish communities existed throughout Europe, Christians were able to make them into foils, villains, and scapegoats. As both Hebrew and Latin chronicles, um, especially of the Second Crusade attest, this had deadly results. And as scholar Anthony Bale succinctly puts it, um, medieval anti-Semitic representations allow us to see that which medieval Christians were not or did not want to be. So I opened with a German example in the context of the Crusades, but the position of Jews in medieval England was particularly fraught. Um, Anti-Jewish sentiment resulted in legal action against Jews earlier in England than on much of the continent in Europe. So to get there, we need to think a little bit about the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, um, which developed and asserted a lot of church reforms, but it also had a dark side. So the Fourth Lateran Council's Canon 68 required that Jews, Christians, and Muslims be distinguished by dress, purportedly to prevent confusion and thus sexual encounters. But the canon wasn't enforced by the church, it was enforced by authorities. And in general, this required that Jews wear identifying markers on their clothing. Um, and this, we actually know what these dress codes looked like mostly from art and architecture. So this is from um, Notre Dame. And you can see that the Jewish characters are wearing the sort of pointed hats. Um, so these are Old Testament figures, but they're dressed like contemporary Jews were required to dress. England was actually the first European power to enforce Canon 68 though. It was made secular law three years later. Um, it was introduced by King Henry III on the 30th of March, 1218. And that happened in the context of multiple waves of violence against Jewish communities by Christians, um, notably at the communities at York, um, that was 1290, 
Barry St. Edmonds in 1181, Norwich in 1184, Lincoln um, in about 1190, and London in 1276. These attacks were often instigated by, simply put, lies and rumors. Claims that Jewish communities had abducted Christian children, for example, led to the attack at Lincoln. England was also the first um, European power to officially spell, expel Jews from the country. So Jews lost their legal status by royal edict of Edward I in 1290. But this legal turning point had pretty much no impact on English anti-Semitism. In fact, it inten intensified it in literature. So there are more anti-Semitic narratives after the Jews lost their legal status in England than even in the years leading up to that legal action. And a lot of that literature, especially from this 12th century point onward, is focused on retellings of the Roman siege of Jerusalem. This is probably not a familiar story to us, so a little bit of context here too. Historically, this siege happened from the year 66 to the year 70, um, and it was politically motivated. So the Romans were trying to prevent a potential rebellion against their rule in the region around Jerusalem. But the siege culminated in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70. It was burned. It's not clear if that was a deliberate act by the Romans or if that was inadvertent, but at any rate, um, it was destroyed. Um, and this destruction had implications for the development of both Christianity and Judaism. We can talk more about that later. It was also really a useful victory to Rome as the military victory gave a lot of political influence to the general Vespasian Vespasian became emperor about halfway through the siege in the year 69, at a moment that was very turbulent in Rome. Um, and so his son Titus actually managed the end of the war in Jerusalem. And this victory in Jerusalem was imagined as a moment of powerful military unity for Rome, even though Rome was in sort of a political mess at this moment. And it's depicted, for example, on the Arch of Titus in Rome. That's the image there. We've got the menorah being removed from the temple. Um, and it was the cause of large civic celebrations within the Roman Empire. We know about it mostly historically from a Jewish historian, Josephus. He was a combatant in the siege, he was captured, and then he wrote his account after the war ended while he was under Roman patronage. His account was translated from Greek to Latin and circulated really widely in lots of different forms throughout the Middle Ages. But Medieval literary narratives transformed these events. They weren't so much interested in politics as they were in religion. Most medieval nations, like France and England particularly, had myths and legends that positioned themselves as the proper true political descendants of the Roman Empire. And they used those to validate their own imperial agendas. But they also let these countries reimagine power and empire in Rome, read it backward. So the literary accounts depict both Vespasian and Titer as eager Christians, as new converts. Their response to their faith formation though is really troubling for us as modern readers. Vespasian and Titus immediately seek revenge on the Jewish community at Jerusalem for its role in the death of Jesus. And this impulse is praised by the religious leaders that have converted them. Depending on the version of the story, this is often an early Pope. Um, and Jewish complicity in Jesus's death was also emphasized in a lot of medieval plays. Um, it's worth noting that those plays, like these stories of the fall of Jerusalem, draw frequently on the gospels themselves, particularly the gospel of John. So while these stories are obscure to us, this narrative of the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans was very familiar for medieval Christian audiences. The Christian liturgy commemorated this violence from the year 740 on on the ninth Sunday of Pentecost, when the passage from Luke 19, um, 41 to 44 is part of the lectionary. And it's actually still in that place in the lectionary. So the passage is as follows. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, this is Jesus, saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God." So this passage was frequently interpreted as predicting the Roman siege and the occupation of the city. 
So it represents, for medieval audiences, Jesus' warning to the Jewish community at Jerusalem of their own impending doom, and the failure of that community to repent, that is to convert, justified the violence and death in the city for medieval Christians. Accounts of the siege were also a part of Holy Week liturgies, um, material from the Book of Lamentations that medieval Christians interpreted as foreshadowing Jerusalem's fall was part of Matin's prayers during Holy Thursday and Good Friday. For French monks, so they actually read the historical versions of the siege over their Easter Sunday meal. Um, so you're having a lovely Easter Sunday dinner and the lector is reading some pretty grim descriptions of the siege of the city and its destruction. And it's worth going back to that Fourth Lateran Council that I mentioned. Um, those same documents that required Jews to be distinguished from Christians in dress also forbade Jews from leaving their homes for the three days before Easter, particularly Good Friday. Um, and anti-Jewish violence was a pretty frequent occurrence during this time of liturgical year. This narrative of anti-Jewish violence was also linked to the Crusades um, by both Christians and Jews in their writing. So Christian documents um, link the impulse to crusade to impulses of vengeance, using Titus and Vespasian as models for crusaders. Um, and likewise, the Chronicle of Solomon Bar Simpson, who's describing events leading up to the First Crusade, makes that connection explicit. Now it came to pass that as they, the crusaders, passed through the towns where Jews dwelled, they said to one another, Look now, we are going a long way to seek out the profane shrine, this is Jerusalem, and to avenge ourselves on the Ishmaelites, the Muslims, when here in our very midst are the Jews, they whose forefathers murdered and crucified him for no reason. Let us first avenge ourselves on them and exterminate them from among the nations so that the name of Israel will no longer be remembered or let them adopt our faith. So beyond this religious and military context, these narratives were really sort of alarmingly popular in literature. So versions of the siege of Jerusalem and the fall of the temple circulated in Latin by the year 700 under the title Vindicta Salvatoris. Um, those were the Latin versions. From the 12th century on, they were popular in vernacular languages, particularly French. Um, in multiple versions, the sort of collective title used is um, the Vengeance de Nostra Seigneur. And it's that title that scholars up until pretty recently used to describe these stories. Um, collectively, the narratives are, were called um, the Vengeance of Our Lord Tradition. And you'll notice I, uh, I call them Fall of Jerusalem narratives. I think Vengeance of Our Lord sort of implies something about who and how um, these are being perceived and sort of reinforces uh, some of the text's agendas. So, while it might be obvious how this story is really useful in the 12th century when you're at the height of the Crusades, what's interesting is that medieval audiences stayed really, really interested in this story. So about 200 years after, the story was adapted and translated into English. This probably suggests it was popular in its French versions in England. Um, and the translation also sort of comes at a moment where there's a large increase in literary production in English and an attempt to bring narratives to broader audiences. So lots and lots of stories are moving from French to English during this time. And this is one of them that got a lot of traction. The story was so popular in England, in fact, that it sparked two distinctive translations within about a hundred years of each other. So one is called The Siege of Jerusalem. It's shorter, um, it's actually, Perhaps interestingly, the poetry is gorgeous and intricate and the story is appalling. Um, the other, which is called either Titus and Vespasian or Destruction of Jerusalem, also circulated. Um, that's the one I've been working on in recent years. And that one retells pretty gruesome violence in Jerusalem in honestly often pretty creepily rhyming couplets. Uh, it has a sort of sing song quality and you get sort of 14 lines of graphic violence in this nursery rhyme style uh, poetry which is an experience. Um, so Siege of Jerusalem survives in nine copies and Destruction survives in 12. And this suggests they were probably pretty popular. So for comparison, um, you may have encountered Beowulf or Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, right? As the texts of the Middle Ages. There's only one copy of each of those, right? 
So the, the, the rate that um, these have survived at is much, much higher. And we also know that the manuscripts that exist were used in red. There's handwriting in the margins of these copies um, that engages with the story and makes notes, sort of reader notes, like you might mark up a book. Um, and that handwriting postdates the manuscripts themselves. So it's late 15th and 16th centuries. And it was also popular and further adapted um, both into sermons and into plays. So there are dramatic versions in six different languages, including multiple performances in England in the 15th century. And these adaptations allowed this story and other anti-Semitic narratives to extend far beyond the Middle Ages in powerful and often troubling ways. So how did we get here? Um, one of the things that strikes me about all these contemporary articulations of Christian nationalism um, and anti-Semitism is that they're working with the same kind of thinking as Augustine, the thinking that underpins these medieval works. That is, they privilege Jews only as Jews are relevant or necessary to Christian notions of salvation. Um, there's been a lot of popular work by scholars starting to think about that, uh, particularly Jewish scholars. But one of the things that's been notable for me as I do this work is that every time I give a talk about fall of Jerusalem narratives, I have to update my dangerous examples of anti-Semitism that I started with at the beginning of this talk. Um, I was at one point flying to give a talk at the University of Michigan and while I was in the air, um, I got off, checked my news app and was like, oh, my talk is out of date. Um, and so there's almost always another dangerous example of this anti-Semitism being enacted. And I wanna end with an example that makes this connection between Christian literature and anti-Semitism explicit and emphasizes how medieval narratives are still shaping our thought, right? I'm going to hazard a guess that this wasn't a very familiar narrative. so. It's hard to imagine that it has influence over us. We don't know about it, um, but these stories and this way of thinking is very baked into a lot of our texts and a lot of our sort of cultural um, experiences. So even if we aren't familiar with the stories themselves, they can have a lot of sway. So a few years ago now, I encountered an NPR story and it was describing how the US embassy in Israel then recently moved to Jerusalem had become a pilgrimage site for American Christians, particularly evangelicals. The piece, um, which is from October of 2018, so also in the aftermath of the Tree of Life pogrom, describes how members of one group of Christian travelers called for his name's sake, purportedly traveled to Jerusalem to reach out to the Jewish people. One group member, Deborah Holm, called the move of the embassy, quote, the Bible being fulfilled in her interview with NPR. Another visitor, Linda Carter, traveled as part of the Beit Tehillah congregation, which is a Christian group that appropriates Jewish traditions in a lot of their worship. And she described the embassy in Jerusalem as follows. So a quote from Carter, this is the center of the earth right here. Not the earth, but the center of our universe, ours. And what struck me about her statement was the way that it perfectly echoes a description of Jerusalem from a 14th century medieval travel text that I've worked on for years. Um, that text is called the Book of John Mandeville and it's a travel narrative that probably doesn't actually describe any travel, right? So it, it's a fictionalized narrative. But in its opening lines, um, the narrator declares that Jesus chose Jer Jerusalem as, quote, the best and the most virtuous and the most worthy in the world for it is the heart and middle of all of the land of the world. And the narrator then uses that statement to justify Christian violence to reclaim the city of Jerusalem from Jewish and Muslim control, so-called foreigners um, in his language. So Mandeville links this idea of Jerusalem as the center of the earth directly to this call for more violence. And Linda Carter's statement emphasizes the extent to which theologies of the Middle Ages are still with us as contemporary Christians. Um, I don't know, but not that many folks read the book of John Mandeville, so I suspect she's not quite familiar with his articulation. Um, and yet she's able to sort of have the same moment. So for me, um, this is a place where my religious identity and my scholarly work really come together. Um, and I think it's important for us to grapple with these histories 
and understand where and how we've fallen short. So these legacies impede interfaith exchange and partnership, and they continue to inspire acts of violence and create human suffering. Where does this leave us? What do we do about it? Um, and I was really struck reading Albert's piece uh, in Happenings this week, and particularly thinking about Lent, right, as a season where we're thinking about repentance. And as we head toward Holy Week, which remains a really stressful time of year for many Jewish communities, this feels like an especially appropriate moment um, for us to do some of that. So as somebody who writes and researches about these issues, I have lots and lots of thoughts, but my hope is that we can discuss these problems and possibilities and our response as a community as well as as individuals. And I'm gonna pause there and stop sharing and engage, I hope, in some conversation with y'all. I did the thing again. I know. This is I, every time I give versions of this uh, talk. There's this moment when I'm like, "Are there questions?" When everybody just kind of goes, "No, I don't have questions. I'm just trying to process all of this." <laughs> well, I'll I'll start with. Uh, uh, are you familiar with? Um, I guess what I would call the national epic anthem of France, the Chanson de Roland, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is very, very anti-Islamic, but the thinking is, is, is the same thinking. Exactly. The, you know. And early on in, in I think the very first uh, less of that long poem, um, the anonymous author identifies uh, Marcille, the, the, the uh, Muslim king, uh, with these words, which show the total ignorance of this author. Uh, and he describes him as Marcille, who does not love God, who serves Muhammad, and who prays to Apollo. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm smiling because uh, that is a common understanding of Muslims. So Muslims in a lot of medieval texts are identified as having four gods who they worship, um, including Apollo, Jupiter, Mohammed, um, and a completely fictional termagon, right? And that's across a lot of French and English texts. So much of this is about exactly what you're saying, Charlotte, is about no real interest in understanding the perspective of the non-Christian community, right? Or no real understanding of their theology and their traditions, but about how they are useful as a foil um, or a way to sort of promote Christian superiority. Yeah. Right. And of course, this was written about 1100, right at the beginning of the 12th century, right? Just, to, just about the very first time the cru first crusade was launched. Exactly. Uh, yep. Pretty much in that militant spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one more quote in, in, in another, of course, uh, throughout, if it, we keep reading, the pagans are in the wrong and Christians are in the right. That's over and over again. But um, early on, um, Roland is 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 bragging about how well they're doing because God is behind them, and uh, he's talking about Cordova, and he says, and there didn't there didn't rest a single pagan who hadn't been, I mean, there didn't remain, live, you know, a single pagan who had not been forced to choose between death and baptism. Yep. And forced to choose. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that it's especially common. Um, uh, so I was citing um, from a, when I was citing the sort of Hebrew uh, text, I was citing from a collection um, of narratives that does something very similar. So it makes the uh, Jewish communities um, who are killed by the crusading forces into martyrs um, for 
their faith, as indeed they were, but it draws on a long tradition of Jewish martyr literature. And uh, it emphasizes that moment of choice, right? You have to choose if you're going to convert or not, right? Um, and it's, yeah, it's pervasive in a lot, a lot of context. Stories of Roland also in that 14th century moment became increasingly popular in England. So there's a, that's another strand of narrative that's getting translated right at the same mm -hmm. time into English. Yeah. Tara, I was thinking for those of us that have been participating in, in the racial yeah. li literature group that recently talking about how narratives from the past live on and continue in this in our case it's, it's white supremacy and American exceptionalism which has fed into current narratives today and how yeah. this mirrors that even though the subject matter is totally different but mm -hmm. it, it is so interesting to me how these things live on yeah. even when when you're as you said not familiar with the original source perhaps or some of the yeah. original sources yeah. I mean I got out of graduate school without having read um one of these narratives. So I'd read one of the sort of two English strands um, and I'd been doing this work on sort of religious contact and exchange um, for a, a long time as part of that. But it was only when I got out that I discovered Destruction of Jerusalem, um, which is the longer one. It is three times as long and at least twice as violent. It's, it's, um, it, <laughs> Karen has asked me, you're, you're working on this poem on purpose, right? Like nobody, nobody made you do this. It's, it's not a fun, piece but I think your point that like it's so baked in um and it's in ways that we don't think about right um, I was thinking about the gospel of John often being used for good Friday right and we wouldn't necessarily know that that has a long long history of being used as a cudgel against Jewish communities yeah. by Christians right so even at this moment, that's really very important for us and our faith, right? Um, in an attempt to sort of create a, a Christian identity that was distinctive from Jewish identity, right? A, a lot of material got baked into that process that's had dangerous impacts for Jewish well, the, Yeah, the, the Gospel of John has a long history of being used in, in a very vindictive way because so often the language in there, explicitly the word Jew, well, yep. that's not really the right word for us, is it? Judean is really a more correct form or Ju Yehudai, but that's an English word, isn't it? Yes. yes. That we somehow have translated or transliterated mm -hmm. from the original language. But the Gospel of John, of course, is very, it's, it's very vile in many ways, but we, we have to live with it. That's our text. Yes. And what do we do with it? And how do we educate ourselves about it, actually? Because, of course, Jesus was Jewish, and all his disciples yes. were Jewish, and the apostles were Jewish. Yes. All the early Christians were Jewish. Uh-huh. And this is such a tricky, um, you're absolutely right, Jonathan, like, this is such a tricky way to say it. This is, it's hard to look back at something that is formative for us, right, as I'm going to say, I'm hazard yes, if you're here on a Sunday morning, faith is in some way formative and important for you, right? Um, and say, there's a lot here that has been used poorly, right? How do we, how do we grapple with that? How do we live with that? Um, how do we understand those choices as reflecting what folks understood to be the wisdom of the time, right? With where we are now, um, we're all always doing the best we can in the moment in which we find ourselves, right? And, and sort of trying to understand in the moment and the context in which we find ourselves. Um, the Gospel of John is the one that is cited most frequently in these Fall of Jerusalem stories by far. And it's mm. also used in a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, medieval drama, um, particularly English, is usually biblical, right? So the most famous uh, medieval drama is basically a collection called the cycle plays and it starts with genesis and it ends with revelation right um and this would have been enacted in public spaces on wagons it would have moved around your city and it would have been done once a year in the summer as a kind of public art festival right it's almost always based on john 
So it's really reliant on a lot of these um, dangerous narratives. And I'm thinking of uh, in Germany, every 10 years, there's a, a passion play. Obergamergau, yeah. Right, and what <laughs> it is reacting the, the pain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and it's a, uh, Germany is a particularly interesting case for lots of reasons, um, oh. in that uh, Germany has responded to their tradition of anti-Semitism in very different ways than we have in the US. Um, and uh, if you didn't read Albert's piece in Happenings, I would commend it to you because I, I read it and was like, wow, he set that one right up for me. Thank you, Albert. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's absolutely um, tricky. But England doesn't like to grapple with it in the same way that the US doesn't like to grapple with it. Um, so only recently, um, I, I mentioned the violence at Lincoln um, and um, Hugh of Lincoln was the name of the little boy who was allegedly abducted and tortured um, by Jewish communities. And it's within the past 15 years that England took the marker down commemorating St. Hugh of Lincoln and put some language around that that said this is this was a false narrative. Um, so, so for generations, it was still sort of this, this Christian centric um, martyrdom. Um, that's also, if anybody's read Chaucer, uh, Chaucer's Prioress's Tale, uh, which is also sort of a, a graphic and appallingly violent um, tale, um, is similarly, is the Hugh of Lincoln narrative, basically. Wow. <laughs> you decided to join. Go for it, Valerie, I see you. Okay, so I'm gonna say a non-academic whacked thing. Good. Um, which is just, aren't we really just getting at, at prejudice against all different faiths? Because the only reason we're talking about uh, Jews and now Muslims is that, is that, is because of location. It's because of the location of Jerusalem. So yeah. wouldn't we be just as have, we, but so, because Jews were scattered, but they were here, as opposed yes. to Buddhists and Confucianists who were somewhere else. So we didn't have to deal with them other than like <laughs> yeah. going to them and trying to convert them. So mm -hmm. don't we have this prejudice versus proselytizing problem globally that we have not begun to think about or deal with, but is the source of vast quantities of problems? Um, so my short answer is yes that this is part of a much larger uh, sort of challenge that Christianity faces in that we're called to go out and spread the word, right? And that some of the interpretations of that have been very damaging for the communities to whom the word is being spread, right? Um, and I, I'm, I'm also going to say, I think Judaism is particularly tricky. I mean, the Abrahamic faiths are particularly tricky in relation to each other because of Jerusalem, because it's a central holy site for all of those traditions um, because uh, Christianity sort of emerged from Judaism. And so the relationship between those two is particularly complicated and that Christianity finds itself in the position, especially in the Middle Ages, of being able to say, no, psh, we've totally left all that Jewish stuff behind, right? But all of you who've gone and become Muslim have gone too far, right? So, so there's this sort of middle position chronologically and temporally that that makes those relationships sticky mm. and I think that the the traditions of violence especially are particularly complicated in the case of Judaism and mm. Islam. We see uh, seem to have a, a re-emerging kind of conspiracy yeah. in America maybe throughout the world and, and 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 the name Rothschild comes up every so often yeah. right the great bankers of the Middle Ages, yep. mm -hmm. and even Shakespeare alludes to this in Merchant of Venice. Yep. And we see, and, and this is sort of non-religious, really. It's just, it's a cultural enculturation that we seem to have in our heads that somehow the Jewish people manage all the money in the world. Mm -hmm. This is an so, issue that I think we need to kind of open up and... Yeah, we do. And it's, so in England, uh, 
Jews arrived in large numbers at the behest of the crown. Um, they were invited and they were invited because of, um, they were invited, they remained the king's serfs. Like they were in a sort of unclear, they only had the legal protection of the crown. And as a result, Jews were forced often into um, yeah. roles like money lending, right? right. Uh, right. And they were continuously exploited by the crown because you could you could just raise taxes on the Jews and no one would complain. And if the Jews complained, you just kick them out, right? Um, so, uh, but it has become sort of a deeply ingrained and deeply damaging yeah. narrative, right? Um, tied into notions that um, because Jews always manage the money, right? They always have the power, right? right. right. Uh, I'm thinking here about narratives that uh, George Soros is going to pay everybody who's protesting. Um, right. I, right. I, I have not received a check. I'm pretty sure it's garbage, right? Like it's <laughs> <laughs> um, right, but there, the, because of the link being made um, and not acknowledging that Jews were in fact forced into this as one of the few occupations open to them in a predominantly Christian region, right? Um, then it's being sort of perverted to say that well, Jews have all of this power, right? Right. Yeah. I think you're right. It's it's tricky, um, and and France is not too far after England um, chronologically uh, in terms of legal removal um, or loss of legal status. I guess is a better way to put it. But but picking up on Madeline and Valerie, it's a it is it, it the same kinds of narratives about power, right, get, get deployed in lots of different spheres, right, whether that's um, sort of race, whether that's prejudice of varying stripes that we see them recur and recur. I'm it's, just thinking too, uh, uh, Cara, about, I think it, it is the 14th century in Spain where you have that brief moment, you know, of, of Jews, Muslims, and Christians living together in this sort of golden age, even though it was only a short period of time. You know, how does that track with what was happening around them at that same time? You know, it, Spain is last. Um, so Spain is the last to sort of link Christianity and nationalism, I'll say. Um, uh, and you do, you have the Convivencia, you have um, particularly Jewish physicians um, and uh, Muslim physicians being very well regarded. Um, but as, uh, as some of these narratives continue to gain traction, right, then, then you see the same, yeah, then you see the same sort of push. And in Spain, I would say it's tricky because the swing the other way is so quick. Right, that that once you have the sort of the uprise of um, Christian nationalism, right, then that becomes both sort of the, the push for the Inquisition, um, right, and the sort of questionable status of anybody who did indeed choose to convert, right, um, as well as that being extended outward. So um, as Spain started uh, some of their own imperial agenda. Right, headed to what we now call the new world, but indeed is just, it was there the whole time as it turns out. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so it has that two, um, that bi-directional challenge. Yeah. And in France, there was a really fascinating thing happening in that the study of Hebrew, like the recognition of Hebrew as a language um, being important so in the Middle Ages, like Hebrew was studied really extensively in France. And then the Jewish community lost their legal status. But we, we still need Hebrew. We just don't need Jews, hmm. who indeed would be the language experts in Hebrew. So there's this tension. Now, with the Renaissance um, and, and the Christians, the humanists, you know, their interest in uh, 
Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, but that was primarily so they could read the original religious text in their in their own language, so, so they could understand it for themselves, and in basically an attack against the scholasticism of the Middle Ages. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and it's funny because you do see some earlier uh, attempts. So uh, things like biblical translation and things that we associate with um, the Protestant Reformation and, and with the Renaissance, you see some pockets of that in the Middle Ages. Um, but absolutely, there's uh, particularly Greek and Hebrew, um, I would say really, really take off in the Renaissance. Um, Latin in some forms is, is there throughout, um, but yeah. And, and eventually the study of Arabic, right? Um, a lot of the texts that they're reading in Greek come to us because they were preserved in uh, Muslim traditions. Well, yeah, because the irony of the whole thing that that the, um, in the East, there really wasn't a Middle Ages. They just kept rolling yep. <laughs> in, in knowledge and so on. Well, we sometimes call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages for two reasons. No, I mean, they were in the dark. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's funny because one of the moves has been in my professional field with my medievalist hat on to think about the global Middle Ages, right? So what is happening during this time that we call the Middle Ages in Western Europe everywhere, right? Okay. How do we actually expand what's happening? But of course, even that term Middle Ages, like I have a colleague who is a Chinese historian and that term makes absolutely no sense to her whatsoever, right? Like it just, mm -hmm. right? So when I give her dates, then she can say, oh, this is what is happening here during this time. Um, mm -hmm. But even those dates vary from country to country in Western yeah. Europe. So Chaucer cites Petrarch in his writing. We think of Petrarch as being in the Renaissance, but Chaucer is medieval. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we use the term dark ages, but it's really a misnomer, isn't it? Sure. They weren't so dark at all. We they have weren't. great great philosophers and thinkers yeah. like Bede and yes. Ephesus. And of course, you have Justinian in the sixth century. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the flourishing of the Eastern Empire kept yes. things going in the, in the Greek. Yep. And, and we in the West were suffering all sorts of problems and, yep. and, <laughs> and, and the invasion of the, uh, the, uh, the Visigoths and so forth. So. And we brought some of those problems with us uh, to Constantinople, right? I mean, right. the Asian Crusaders decided- Let's not forget the Fourth Crusade. Indeed, right? <laughs> they, 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 they pillaged. Oh, yeah. let's, let's stop over here at Constantinople and get some of the goods. All of yeah. them, oops, right? Like, it's a, <laughs> we have that, but it's tricky because it is this period, and I, I deal with this with students a lot, right? My students, they have to take a course in pre-1800 literature, and they're often really mad about it, like extremely mad. Um, but it's okay, they'll take it because Dr. McShane's not so bad. And so um, I'm like, so the rise of the university in the West is a product of the Middle Ages, right? The science of vision, of, of optics, makes leaps and bounds during this period, right? Um, there were certainly some medical practices that weren't great, but we actually have some that work, right? So there's an early English... Uh, Re recipe, an herbal recipe, and a couple of years ago, some scientists tried it out and discovered it has antibiotic properties, and that's how it worked, right? Um, so they're both of those things, right? And I mean, Augustine, who gives us so much that is good and valuable and uh, powerful for the church, also gives us this, I, I say it's sometimes called the doctrine of toleration. I, I hate that term, right? Like, that's the term it's known by, but I, I just don't see toleration as a goal right? Like, I think we could do better uh, than tolerating each other. Like, that's pretty low bar. So um, uh, all of this is bound up together, right? Bernard of Clairvaux was a wonderful, powerful preacher. He also used that to instigate the Crusades, right? Um, and if you're looking for a popular history of the Crusades, I have a colleague who wrote an open access book, and it's wonderful, and it will completely break all of your conceptions of the Crusades. Um, her name is Susanna Throop, and it's the Crusades and Epitome. Um, it's available online. Um, 
but she situates it differently. So rather than thinking about it from the Western Europe perspective, she thinks about it from the Mediterranean region specifically and how it, it all reads very differently if you start there. Yeah. I, I think that raises an interesting point and in, you're talking about social location and it's like, where, where are we at as St. Paul's? Um, I'm, I think for Bible study this week, we watched a sermon from the National Cathedral, which was from last week um, mm -hmm. by Dr. Amy Jo Levine, who's a Jewish scholar of the New Testament. Um, and she's wonderful. Um, yes. And so she's taught, and she mentioned, she said a lot of the things that you're saying about how the... Um, the lectionary text, the history of the interpretation has been damaging to, you know, Semitic communities. And so it's interesting to think about, you know, in that diocese, they, they passed a resolution to say, we want to reform our, our lectionary mm -hmm. because of the, the dangers of this, yeah. you know, and that's, that's a big step, I think, um, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but it, sure. it, it raises a challenge and a question as to are there things here that um, maybe these, I, I call them the ghosts of the empire, you know, the <laughs> empire has gone, but the ghosts are still walking. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, where are the ghosts that need to be banished? You know, and that's, I don't have an answer, but I, I think this talk gets us to think about that. Are there ghosts from this anti-Semitic past? And not that you're on a, a, a wild witch hunt or anything, but Len is a season of reflection and pausing, and it's a time to think through, are, are there things that we can repent of as a community? And um, I, I think it's interesting uh, to follow up on it, Dan, but the fact that this talk can be given in the context of a church community is important, right? Just that, like y'all's willingness to hear me be like, let's talk about how Christians were really terrible for a really long time, right? That's I have a Jewish colleague who very kind, I, who I've worked with a fair bit. She's in my writing group, so we share work in progress. And she said, you're giving this talk at your church? Right? Like, it was stunning to her that folks would be willing to hear that, right? And so, so my hope is exactly that, that, that it's a call to conversation, right? It's a call to thinking about um, where have we um, where do we have opportunities to, to think differently, right? And where have we um, fallen short, right? But the power of who we are as Christians and what we do as St. Paul's is that we actually believe in that, right? That it is, it is okay that we have fallen short. What's next? Well, St. Paul's has had a history of working together with, with Mishkan Shalom, the synagogue. <laughs> Uh, on, on, on some common themes, uh, particularly with the Palestinian uh, situation. So, and our previous rector certainly uh, pulled that together nicely for us. Absolutely. So and we have we have a history. And, and there's, um, and that is how to do it, right? Because when we do that, we see where those common themes are, yeah. right? We see where those common strands are. Um, my Jewish colleague is a musician and so music is obviously, surprise, music is important to me as a member of the choir. Um, but so, so thinking about sacred music together has been wonderful and valuable and fruitful for both of us um, as sort of people of faith and as scholars, right? So where we can find common ground is worth doing. That, that raises an interesting point about um, like what you talked about with proselytization and, and thinking about, okay, we're people of the word, but we have this view of the word that's very one directional. You know, we preach, there's a monologue. And thinking about, okay, the spirit of proselytization and evangelization is this idea of entering into conversation. And I think that presents in a little bit of a different way. Yeah. Um, and really an open-ended conversation, not with an agenda of, I'm only entering this conversation so that there's the potential for someone to join, you know, our, our little group over here. But I think, I think there's a real, um, 
I think it's a different way of reading scripture, honestly, where scripture is this dialogue yeah. between different authors. And, and I think we do believe there's a coherent unifying message in the person of Jesus. Right. Um, that's what makes us distinct as a community, but it, it's much more dialogical. And I think that that changes kind of when we think about sharing good news. Yeah. There's, a, there's a big ear with that as well. And wh- where's the good news and where is Christ working? Yep. Um, even if other communities wouldn't call Christ Christ, but where right. is this larger, larger spirit working? We had um, us, our confirmation class this year with uh, the Germantown Jewish Center, we had a night where the two confirmation classes zoomed together. Oh, that's and, cool. Yeah, and to talk about um, kind of what was happening and what their process was like. And I think they came to that conclusion, you know, there's more that we have in common than, than what separates us. And that was cool to be a part of. Yeah. Um, it was very cool. It is awesome. It's oh. cool. Well, could, I, could I just say that on the subject of the lectionary, of the, you know, there's always a danger in if you only read or only know or only remember pericopes. And I'd like to put in a plug for Wednesday morning Bible study. Yes. Which, <laughs> I second that. You have to, uh, which there's is, a lot in that book we don't get to in the lectionary. There's an awful lot we don't. So. And we're like, all trying yep. to put it in context. Yep. Well, it's like Carol said this morning in her sermon, if you just pull out that pericope in numbers, you might not know where you're, you're at. You have, to, you have to look at what preceded it and left, uh, yep. you know, led up to that. Mm-hmm. And, and it's so true. You really need, you need, you need the whole picture. Mm-hmm. And it also helps us, I think, to grapple, not just with the context in which it was written, but the context in which it's used yeah. and has been used, right? You, you right. can't, right. you can't, adjust that if you don't understand how it came to be that way yep context was, context I historical was context the, the very times it was and of course we can go on and on about the writing of john's gospel you oh know, yes it, it, takes, it takes decades after the events but and after the fall of the temple right exactly <laughs> so yep and again ironically john's gospel and the way we're you know approaching it and the way you know the objections to it, and yet it's known as the gospel of love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it is. Mm-hmm. I know, but I'm, I'm just saying it's yeah. not the way it's being perceived sure. when you when you just see all this uh, paper in it. Absolutely. Well, yeah, and I think in, in John's gospel, you, you see the best of who we are as a community and the worst of who we are, mm-hmm. and, it, and there's a tension, yeah. and I think that's where I think that's where we need a strong theology of resurrection and the cross, yeah. where if we have such a strong theology of the resurrection and, and happy, happy, joy, joy, you know, we, we get this triumphalism and yeah. that leads to nationalism and wanting to conquer other empires, other peoples, bringing them yeah. into our mold, whatever. But mm-hmm. this, this truly following the way of the cross is it's, it's us, you know, who are entering this way of Jesus and, and finding blessing in that somehow and yeah. not seeing, oh, no, who was it that, that took Jesus down? That's missing the whole point um, yep. mm-hmm. of, of what the whole story is about. Is. Yep. Um, absolutely. I've, uh, I think about students and I have... Uh, I tend to have two strains of students. I have students who are Christian, um, generally Protestant, sometimes evangelical, and they are horrified by my classes for one reason, right? And it's it's important also to not walk the line between my students who are not religious um, than being like, see, I told you, right? Mm-hmm. It is, it's very easy to fall into the trap, especially when you're reading some of these literatures of, see, it's all awful, right? I told you. Um, and, and so helping students to see both the, the power and the flourishing um, and the failings, right? Um, y'all are an easier audience. I don't need to sell you on Christianity. <laughs> like it's being okay, right? Like, um, 
I assume we're mostly there. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you so much, Dr. McShay. Thank you so much for just opening up space for conversation and teaching us. And we are just so, we are so blessed and honored to have you this morning on daylight a, savings. I know it's a wonderful- I didn't even realize it. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> but it's a, this is a wonderful place to be in community. Yeah. I'm grateful um, for y'all finding the time and the willingness to come hear me talk about some lovely and unpleasant things this morning. Um, thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Kara.